Good afternoon, everyone. So one of the most important things that a director can bring to an organization is a vision. And since I haven't had a chance to discuss my vision with all of you yet, I thought I would take a few minutes at the beginning of my presentation today uh, to discuss my vision for NIEHS. Now, to understand the vision fundamentally, the substance of my vision is defined by five leadership values. Could I have the next slide, please? And uh, these values were informed by my personal and professional experience, as well as my passion for the science that we support at NIEHS. They also reflect what I learned during my many listening sessions with the staff and the various stakeholders across the entire environmental health sciences community during the nearly 10 years that I spent as either the uh, deputy director or the acting director at the Institute. So I plan to use these leadership values as a framework to guide the implementation on the goals that follow from the three overarching themes in our strategic plan. So all five leadership values listed on the slide here are equally important. So don't assume that one is more important uh, or one has a higher priority based on the, the presentation order that I give you this morning. So let me start off. So my first leadership value, as you can see on the slide, is about, it's really focused on building the strongest possible workforce. And it's based on the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this uh, actually is a very high priority for me as the director of NIEHS. So without a strong and diverse workforce, um, an organization has nothing. I believe that uh, NIEHS will remain a global leader in discovery and innovation only by supporting a highly talented staff from a variety of backgrounds. Embracing these principles is the right thing to do. And actually, I think it's the smart thing to do. A diverse, creative, and highly motivated workforce with a wide range of skill sets and viewpoints will keep us right at the cutting edge of environmental health sciences research. So my second leadership value is communication. So we need to focus on proactive and thoughtful two-way communication, where we learn to listen as carefully as uh, well as learning how to express our ideas. We need to do this in a way that our colleagues across the Institute and uh, all relevant members of stakeholder groups across the environmental health sciences community feel that they can openly express their ideas and express their thoughts without any inhibition. We wanna promote transparency and trust in the highest possible quality of communication. So I, I need to know what's on your mind. Uh, and I need to know this because if there's ever a, a chance for change, um, I need to know what you're thinking. So innovation is my third leadership value. And IHS has a proud history of success based on embracing innovation but we need to be looking forward and not dwelling on the past. I know that we can do more. We have strong intramural and extramural divisions. And since it's possible, it's, it's, it's impossible to know where the next transformative idea will emerge from, we need to consider an environment that rewards diversity of thought. So my job is to create the environment where bold new ideas can be presented and given a fair hearing. And we can debate these bold new ideas and then make decisions based on the ideas that are presented. We also need to adopt the latest and greatest technological advances from the, across the biomedical community. And we should not hesitate to develop new technologies and approaches where necessary to fill the gaps in our current experimental designs. We need to move the concept of high risk, high reward research beyond what we have done in the past. Establishing new incentives and rewards for innovative thinking will be a priority for me to help us push the envelope. So in this context, I've established a new senior leadership position here at NIEHS called the Chief Innovation Officer. And you'll hear more about the person who's currently in an acting role in that in just a few minutes. And I expect that uh, this, this Chief Innovation office, Officer will serve as a catalyst to promote the type, to pr to promote the type of innovative thinking uh, across the environmental health sciences community. So strong and distributed leadership at all levels is my fourth leadership value. So working with all of you in the global community, we collectively developed the Institute's strategic plan. And my focus for the next several years will be to execute on the plan. But as director of NIEHS, I cannot do this on my own. This is why I'm committed to the type of distributed leadership that draws on regular input from scientists and stakeholders from across the environmental health sciences community. And finally, collaboration is my fifth leadership value. The environment plays an important role in all diseases and adverse health effects being studied across the National Institutes of Health. 
I hope to integrate our work assessing environmental exposures into the fabric of research involving the etiology of disease. So I will actively seek to bring environmental health sciences together with investigators at other NIH institutes and other federal agencies. So on this vision, I need your help. So please take, take some time to evaluate these values. Uh, think carefully about whether they resonate with you and provide me with some feedback. And I hope that as we adopt a common set of leadership values, a new collective compelling and shared vision will emerge that we can all embrace and rally behind. Overlaying this powerful shared vision on the themes and the goals of our strategic plan, I believe, will help to guide the environmental health sciences community to reach new heights. So let's go to the next slide, please. I'm just gonna pause. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, terrific. So let me move on now beyond my vision. We'll talk about some of the issues relating to budget. So after five continuing resolutions since the start of the fiscal year on October 1st, Congress finally passed and the president signed into law the what's called the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021, which is also referred to, it's also referred to as the FY21 Omnibus Appropriations and COVID-19 Supplemental Bill. The NIH is funded at about $42.9 billion for FY21, which is an increase of 1.4 billion or about 3.5% over the FY20 levels. NIHS is funded at uh, about 815 million, which is about $12 million or a 1.5% increase over FY20. So the NIHS Superfund activities are funded at 81.5 million, which is about $500,000 or about a 0.62% increase over FY20. Our, our $10 million budget from the Department of Energy did not change. So overall, what this means is that the budget for NIHS is now just slightly north of $900 million. So most ICs had an increase similar to what the NIHS has received, about 1.5%, while some ICs and the OD received significantly higher increases, which brought the average for the NIH up. So for example, the OD secured an additional $1.15 billion to provide research and clinical trials related to the long-term studies of COVID-19, or the long-hauler effects. And they also received another $100 million for the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Initiative. So in the end, we didn't get as much as we were expecting based on some of the early indications from the House and the Senate, but we are happy to receive a budget increase when other agencies of the federal government are not receiving increases in their budgets. So let's go to the next slide, please. I also wanna comment, uh, since the last time we met, as all of you know, there's been an election. And I'm really pleased to report that the Biden administration was quick to recognize the value of science and to recognize the importance of the work at the NIH. It is noteworthy that soon after he was sworn in, the president visited the main campus to deliver remarks about the hard work and the outstanding contributions the NIH staff has made to combat COVID-19. Also, the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, made a virtual visit to the NCI Cancer Center. I think it was last week. And it was remarkable that Vice President Harris visited the NIH last month uh, uh, together with the second gentleman uh, to receive their second dose of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. And they received this at the NIH Clinical Center. Of course, while they were there, Francis and, and Tony and others had a, a visit, and uh, we learned at that point that her uh, that Vice President Harris's uh, mother was an NIH-funded cancer researcher, and she commented that she remembers the days when her mother served on NIH study sections. I suspect my son remembers those days, too, when his father kind of disappeared for weeks on end uh, preparing for those study sections. So overall, I think it was really just simply encouraging to get such a strong showing of support from the highest levels of government. Another strong sign of support for science by the Biden administration is that Dr. Eric Lander was appointed as the presidential science advisor. And uh, also that the president created a cabinet level appointment for Dr. Lander. So I think this is really good news. I know Eric well, and on top of being an outstanding scientist, he is also a terrific communicator. 
He knows exactly how to describe the importance of the work the NIH is doing to non-scientists and to legislators. I've seen him in action. And he is not bashful, I think as many of us know who know Eric, he is not bashful about expressing his opinion in a meaningful and a compelling way. So I just can't help but think that this is a good for all of us in, in science. So let's go to the next slide, please. So let me move on now to provide um, a summary of some of the work that has happened since the last time we were together in September. So I want to remind everyone of the three themes that provide the framework for our strategic plan, which is advancing environmental health sciences, promoting translation data to knowledge to action, and enhancing scientific stewardship and support. So the next slide, please. So again, as you hopefully remember, theme one involves studying how environmental exposures impact all levels of biological organization. You know, from the molecular biochemical pathway, from the cellular tissue, organ system, model organism, individual and population, and at all stages across the lifespan from preconception through old age. So next slide, please. So the first science advance I want to uh, highlight comes from Dr. Archer's laboratory in our uh, division of intramural research. As many of you may know, I'm very interested in better understanding the impact of the genetic and the epigenetic background on various biological outcomes. And Dr. Archer and his colleagues are generating induced pluripotent stem cells derived from adult differentiated cells from patients with different diseases, all in an attempt to create IPS disease models from these, uh, of, of the disease these patients are experiencing. Uh, not unexpectedly, they found that the genetic uh, variability inherent in different patients affects the reprogram efficiency of generating the IPS lines. So therefore, they conducted a series of experiments to compare the transcriptomic profile from 72 dermal fibroblast and IPS-derived lines. So they compared equal numbers of samples from self-reported African Americans and white Americans and identified both ancestry-dependent and ancestry-independent transcripts associated with reprogramming efficiency. So this result suggests that transcriptomic heterogeneity based on genetic and epigenetic background uh, can substantially affect programming efficiency. So overall, this work provides insights. Uh, if you, actually, if you're interested, read the paper. It provides some very interesting insights into, into the different mechanisms of ancestry-dependent regulation of cell fate transitions associated with pro reprogramming efficiency. Next slide, please. So the next science advance that I want to highlight involves investigators across the Institute working on the environmental factors that are involved in maternal morbidity and mortality. So American mothers are dying and suffering from disease at alarming rates, and it has been estimated that 60% of maternal deaths are preventable. From 2011 to 2015, rates of maternal deaths were threefold higher for blacks and twofold higher for Afri African, I'm sorry, American Indian and Alaska Natives and uh, compared to whites. So it is striking that the U.S. has the highest, mort uh, highest maternal mortality rate amongst high income countries. And the mortality rate increased 16.7% while global maternal mortality decreased from 20, uh, 1990 to 2015. So we got a problem. So scientists from across the NIH joined together to create the Maternal Morbidity Task Force, which is working to implement a maternal and pregnancy outcomes vision called IMPROVE. Scientists across the NIHS collaborated to publish a high-level overview of what is known about the environmental contributions to maternal health. They were specifically interested in reviewing the non-genetic environmental factors that contribute to maternal morbidity and mortality um, through the chemical exposures in air, water, soil, food, and consumer products. So their overview was also included an assessment of how non-chemical stressors may exacerbate the effects of chemical exposures on maternal health. So their publication underscores the importance of how environmental exposures impact hypertensive disorders of pregnancy fibroids and infertility, as well as long-term maternal health impacts, such as higher risk of breast cancer and metabolic disorders. It's clear that identifying and reducing a pregnant woman's environmental exposures is not only beneficial to her offspring, but is also uh, beneficial and important to preserve her short-term and long-term health. So the next slide, please. 
So I also want to uh, highlight a, the work um, shown on this slide by Cynthia Ryder and Scott Arbach, uh, Dory Grimolik, and many of their colleagues in the Division of the National Toxicology Program. So in this publication, they describe their work to compile a rich resource to explore data on polycyclic aromatic compounds, or PACs. They used computer workflows, algorithms, and clusters to contextualize PAC hazard characterization to predict eight different toxicity profiles of various PACs and other classes of compounds based on structure and hazard characterizations. The results are available and searchable through an interactive web application. So the strategy can be used to prioritize PACs for further testing and will aid in chemical read across efforts and can be extended to other classes of compounds which need hazard characterization. So congratulations to our colleagues in the Division of the National Toxicology Program. So the next, uh, next slide, please. I also want to highlight a, a fascinating study by Claudia Gunch and her colleagues at Duke in the extramural division. Uh, they assembled a subset of 79 children and their mothers from the newborn epigenetic study and they did this to evaluate the impact of the exposure of semi-volatile organic compounds, or SVOCs. Specifically, they were interested in assessing whether exposure to SVOCs is associated with changes in the gut microbiome in children. So they measure levels of 44 SVOCs, including triclosan, phthalates, and several members of the PFAS family. And they did this in the blood and the urine of 69 children aged three to six years. Then they evaluated the microbiome using the standard DNA sequencing techniques. So what they found is that most microbes are not overtly compromised or changed as a consequence of the exposure of SVOCs. However, a fraction of the gut microbiome involving specific types of bacteria and fungi did change in abundance in a way that correlated with increasing SVOC exposure. They found that 10 genera historically capable of reductive dehalogenation displayed significant positive association with halogenated SVOCs, which this suggested that these compounds may put selective pressure and may facilitate change in the distribution of microbes within the gut of children. So it's of interest to note that these changes in these dehalogenating microbes was previously found to be associated with adverse health effects like asthma in adults. So next slide, please. So I hope you all enjoyed you know, getting a little a taste of the type of science that we support at NIEHS. And let me move on now to theme two. And so just to remind everyone, so theme two is about promoting translation data to knowledge to action. And this theme recognizes that the value of advancing environmental health sciences can only be fully realized through translation of our science so that it can be used by the public health providers, regulators, and policymakers to help inform their decisions. So next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to, under theme two, I'd like to showcase some of the recent work of the Disaster Research Response Program, which is spearheaded by Aubrey Miller and several of his colleagues in the office of the director of Bethesda, as well as colleagues throughout the Institute. So just to remind you, this program was developed several years ago in collaboration with the National Library of Medicine. And the purpose was to improve our nation's capabilities to ensure that when a disaster strikes, the public health research community is ready to respond. So it aims to provide ready to go research data collection tools in the form of surveys, forms, and research protocols. Well, fortunate for us, as we all know, a disaster happened this last year. So the DR2 program was ready to go to work when the pandemic hit. Aubrey worked quickly together with investigators across NIHS to bring uh, environmental health science expertise and the DR2 resources to bear on the pandemic. The team is coordinating with other NIH efforts to uh, develop common data elements for researchers. And it's noteworthy that there are currently over 97 COVID related tools and questionnaires in the DR2, uh, DR2 uh, toolkit. The DR2 team also worked closely with groups in OBSSR on the social, behavioral, and economic grants to incorporate DR2 measures. So next slide, please. So I also want to comment that the DR2 program 
uh, fosters a national network of trained researchers to collect needed data. So EHS DR2 network, the EH, uh, DHS DR2 network currently has 70 different per participants, as you can see on the map here. And these are derived from EHS core Superfund and worker training centers, as well as other interested grantees from across the nation. The centers facilitate information sharing, they foster collaboration, they improve resources, conduct disease research, and help communities. The center and grantee network is hosting the inaugural symposium on COVID research response, which has been happening virtually and launched in the middle of January. The, top, the, the topics of the symposium included routes of transmission and exposure uh, mitigation, mental health impacts of COVID-19 response, addressing COVID challenges with community partners, and COVID-19, social vulnerability and environmental injustice. And some of these, uh, these, uh, these conferences have already happened, in which case you can get on the website and you can you know, watch the recorded sessions. And for those that haven't already happened, uh, you can find out when they are, you can register for them and hopefully you can participate if you're interested. So next slide, please. So another way that, uh, that NIHS is contributing to theme two is the work that we are doing in support of the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, or the RADx initiative, which hopefully many of you remember, Dr. Collins developed in the spring of 2020 to encourage the, some innovation in the development, commercialization, and implementation of technologies for COVID-19 testing. So RADx RAD, which is one part of the RADx effort, is for RADx Radical and it supports new and non-traditional radical approaches to address current gaps in our knowledge. So uh, Dr. Uh, Ozzy Lazoya and Dr. Doug Bell at NIEHS in the Environmental Epigenetics and Disease Group, uh, they applied to receive funding through the RADx RAD initiative, and they were the only in-house research proposal across the NIH to receive RADx funding, RADx RAD funding. So Bell and Lazoya's proposal involves taking cells from either a nasal swab or a saliva sample, extracting all messenger RNA, conducting RT-PCR in a way that all molecules are barcoded. And then what they do is they pool the samples from hundreds or thousands of individuals and they perform next-gen sequencing. So in the end, they use bioinformatics to determine which uh, uh, whether any of the viral transcripts are present uh, within the sample, in which case, of course, the individual has an active infection. But additionally, unlike other approaches that are being taken, they can use some of the other messenger RNAs that are barcoded for that individual to get an expression profile of the genes that are being expressed in the cells of an infected individual. And what they hope to be able to do is to, uh, to predict biological outcomes. So can they figure out the individuals that have a active infection that are close to being asymptomatic or are likely to have a mild uh, set of symptoms versus those that are likely to be hospitalized or possibly even die from down the road from the infection? So they expect to be able to perform over 50,000 tests per run for less than $6,000 in additional costs. So Stay tuned, uh, stay tuned. We may be using this technology for high throughput COVID testing in the near future, or potentially uh, it's part of the whole RADx RAD program to, to develop the types of testing strategies that will be um, available for the inevitable pandemics that will be happening in the future. Next slide, please. So as part of theme two, I also want to uh, you know, comment that um, in, in order to further um, uh, further increase dialogue uh, across the environmental health sciences community and to encourage research collaboration, I work together with Christine Flowers and Jesse Saffron and OCPL to launch a monthly column in the environmental factor. It's called the Director's Corner. So the column will include interviews with thought leaders throughout the environmental health sciences community. So you may have seen the, uh, the interview with uh, Cheryl Walker, which came out this month. The idea is to provide a forum to share and, expo and explore bold and innovative ideas, uh, share new research approaches, discuss new environmental health collaboration opportunities. Uh, the topics will follow from the leadership values that I discussed earlier in my presentation. And uh, I might add um, that um, 
the, the leadership values that I discussed earlier on were actually featured in the inaugural column last month. Okay, so let's see. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I'm having some problems yeah. on my end. So you can we still hear, hear us. Okay, I can hear you okay, Rick. Yeah. My internet is back. Uh, so fortunately, I'm talking by or speaking by the phone. <laughs> so it goes. Um, anyway, I just also wanted to comment that the, the, the director's corners is designed in such a way that you can get to know the person or the scientist behind the work. So uh, hopefully uh, all of us uh, know a little bit more about Cheryl Walker. And um, in the next month and the months following, you'll have a chance to get to know some of the other investigators or you know, non-scientists who are involved in the work that uh, drives the mission of NIEHS. Next slide, please. So let me move on to discuss uh, some of the progress that we have under theme three, which is about enhancing EHS through stewardship and support. Let me pause just a minute so everyone can still hear me okay, correct? Yes, sir, we can hear you fine. Yes. Okay, that's good. Boy, this is really weird. This is very unstable on my end. So we recognize, um, so it's really about recognizing that success in the mission requires that NIHS continue to provide strong stewardship of our human financial and infrastructure resources. So next slide, please. So the first slide here is the announcement that we have selected Dr. Gary Ellison as the acting director of DERT. So Gary introduced himself uh, earlier in our, in our meeting. So I wanna take this opportunity to thank Pat Mastin for stepping into his role, the acting director role over the past year and a half. So Pat reminded me last September that he agreed to serve as the acting director for about a year and that it was about a year last September. Um, so he was interested in getting back to his position of reference as the deputy director of DERT. So we launched a competitive search across the NIH and of the different individuals that applied in the end, we selected Dr. Ellison for this position. So Gary comes to us on an active detail from the National Cancer Institute, where his position of reference is the chief of the environmental epidemiology branch. He has extensive experience working with NIEHS. And, and I think it's so all we all of us know, especially as the ex officio member of council in, in previous council meetings. So he is recognized for his work on breast cancer and the environment, and his in, he's also recognized for his involvement in global environmental occupational health programs. So he started officially on January 25th. So let me take this uh, opportunity again to welcome Gary to the senior leadership team. Okay, next slide, please. So I also want to recognize Dr. Michelle Bennett, who is also on a, an official detail from the NCI. So I want to thank Ned Sharpless for his willingness to uh, lend some of his senior staff to us here at NIEHS. So Dr. Bennett has stepped in to serve in this new role that I've created in the office of the director called the Chief Innovation Officer. So her responsibilities include working to develop solid strategies for managing our operations and our science at NIEHS. And most importantly, to step in and to catalyze innovative thinking during the development of these strategies. So she's working with me on several projects currently, and, uh, and which include developing a collaborative, you know, looking at developing collaborative opportunities between NIEHS and the NCI. So welcome also to Michelle. It's great to have you with us. Next slide, please. So I also wanna spend a few minutes uh, under theme three uh, to update you on the progress that we've made with the NIEHS Scholars Connect program. So this is a program, I think many of you may have heard about this, but if you haven't, it's a program that was launched back in 2012, and it was the brainchild of Derek, uh, Dr. Erica Reed. It was based on the Meyerhoff program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is designed to help launch underrepresented minorities into careers in STEM. Uh, the program is an academic year, three semester paid internship, and it's designed to provide mentoring and research training and professional development in the environmental health sciences. The program provides opportunities for undergraduate, uh, junior and senior STEM majors from HBCUs and surrounding institutions. I think we've actually extended that to uh, some of the junior colleges um, in the area. So next slide, please. 
so and uh, you can see on this slide, uh, it shows, shows some of the data. So 62% of the participants were African Americans, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, or Hispanic Latino students. And as you can see, many of the program's graduates are pursuing advanced degrees in STEM. Great. So that's exactly what we were hoping would happen. So who knows? Maybe one of the future directors of NIHS will have gotten their start in science through the NSCP. So next slide, please. I also want to pay tribute to Chip Hughes, who recently retired from NIHS. And uh, he, I guess, was retired for about maybe two hours. And then he was selected and named as the Deputy Assistant and Secretary for Pandemic and Emergency Response for the Biden administration at OSHA. So Chip directed the NIHS worker training program for 30 years. And it was through his really relentless efforts that um, your know, workers benefited. Uh, worker safety and health benefited from his leadership. So as I announced at a recent council meeting, and I want to emphasize again because it's important, the Occupational Health and Safety Section of the American Public Health Association selected CHIP to receive the 2020 Alice Hamilton Award. So this award recognizes the lifelong contribution of individuals who have distinguished themselves through a career of hard work and dedication to improve lives of workers. So next slide, please. So the scope of Chip's, of, of Chip's impact during his tenure at NIHS is, is pretty remarkable. So he guided the worker training program through significant expansion and brought its influence to bear on the health and safety needs of workers who were involved in the response, recovery, and remediation efforts of the World Trade Centers. Uh, Chip's leadership also guided the worker training program through numerous natural disasters, including Western wildfires. And Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Sandy, Harvey, Maria, and Florence. So the worker training program also extended its reach under Chip's leadership to man-made disasters, such as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So Chip also led the worker training program through biosafety responses, such as the Ebola. And most recently, they're doing just absolutely remarkable work in the COVID-19 pandemic. So since 2005, you know, the stats are just incredible. The HAZMAT Disaster Preparedness Training Program has offered more than 10,000 courses for 150,000 workers, totaling around 1.5 million contact hours of training. So we all wish CHIP the best, and I think I'm speaking for all of us in saying that I'm actually reassured that CHIP will be working on our behalf as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Pandemic and Emergency Response at OSHA. Next slide, please. So I also, also want to acknowledge that uh, with, Chip's uh, with Chip's departure, we are uh, in good hands. Uh, so we have named uh, Ms. Sharon Beard as the new acting director of the worker training program. Sharon is highly capable of undertaking this new responsibility. She has a bachelor's from Western Carolina University and a master's in environmental health science and management from Tufts. She has worked for the program for over 25 years and was honored with the Lauren Kerr Award from the American Public Health Association Occupational Health and Safety Section. So we thank Sharon for her willingness to step in and we're all looking forward to working with her in her new role. Next slide, please. So it's also important to acknowledge awards that our staff and members of the environmental health sciences uh, community have received. So Masa Nagashi uh, was uh, unanimously approved by the Board of Scientific Counselors as an NIH Emeritus Investigator, uh, which is a position that he assumed after his recent retirement on December 31st. So additionally, Kelly Ferguson received the inaugural Lou Goulet, a junior Outstanding Young Investigator Award from the HEADS Association, which is a nonprofit that integrates and promotes scientific developments in the study of chemicals that disturb the endocrine system. So congratulations to both Massa and to Kelly. Next slide. Also, I want to acknowledge that Dr. Franco DeMaio was elected president of the Society for the Study of Reproduction, and Lisa Ryder received the 2020 James T. Cassidy Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is an award that recognizes members of AAP's or rheumatology section for their outstanding achievement um, in pediatric rheumatology. So congratulations to Franco and to Lisa. And next slide. I wanna acknowledge Anne-Marie Duquette won a highly competitive bench to bedside grant from the National Institutes of Health. 
This two-year, $300,000 grant will fund a clinical study of how vitamin D supplements may improve women's reproductive health. So congratulations to Anne-Marie. Next slide, please. So I also want to acknowledge Alyssa Chi and Mandy Goldberg and Victoria Placentra for receiving the Best Elevator Pitches Award during the 2020 Science Days here at NIHS. This is a competition that helps our trainees fine tune their uh, communication skills and how to succinctly and thoughtfully describe the work that they are doing, which I think is, personally, I think this is something that we, we all feel will serve them well throughout the rest of their careers. So congratulations to Alicia, Mandy, and Victoria. Next slide. And I also want to uh, mention the special issue of DNA repair that highlights the scientific contributions of Sam Wilson. Uh, the issue was titled Tribute to Sam H. Wilson's Shining Light on Base Excision Repair. So congratulations, Sam. Next slide, please. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Jennifer Kay for receiving the Karen Wetterham Award. A case research evaluates how genetic factors affect susceptibility to mutations and how, uh, well, both to mutations and to, to the development of cancer following exposure to n nitrosodimethylamine which is a contaminant found near a Superfund site in Wilmington, Massachusetts. So I also want to acknowledge the 2B Technologies company with its chief scientist, Dr. John Burks. 2B Technologies was among the 38 companies that were selected and announced by the Small Business Administration for the 2020 Tibbetts Awards, which is an award to acknowledge and recognize the economic, technical, and societal benefits from SBIR and STTR funding. Next slide, please. And finally, no director's report would be complete without acknowledging the SOT awards. So the achievement award was to Andrew Patterson from Penn State. The Distinguished Toxicology Scholar Award is Deborah Corey Schelecta from the University of Rochester. The education award was Wei Zhang from Purdue University. The Founders Award for Outstanding Leadership in Toxicology is Michael Gallo from Rutgers. Leading Edge in Basic Science Award was to Dana Delanoy from the University of Michigan. The Public Communications Award was Johnny Lewis at the University of New Mexico. Translational Impact Award was to Rebecca Fry, the University of North Carolina. And the Best Postdoctoral Publication Award was Suzanne Martos from NIEHS. So next slide, please. I think that should be it. So let me thank all of you and we have plenty of time to take any and all questions that you may have. So Nathan, if you could stop sharing the screen and let's get everyone's image back up on the, the monitor here. And so we are monitoring questions. the chat to see if anyone has to, wants to, um, and, and the hand raising, if you have a question, please, uh, please let us know. Okay. Oh, Lynn, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Goldman, I just saw your, your chat. Please uh, go ahead. I can always hey, Lynn, be go ahead. Hi there, I can always be counted on to ask a question. I hate uh, for this opportunity to pass off that we would not be asking you questions. I, Rick, first and foremost, that was a wonderful presentation and it is just great to see the kind of leadership that you're bringing. I, love the approach that you have that of collaboration across the various institutes at NIH and the way that you work um, with the director's office. It's just so important. Um, regrettable that, um, that more um, money isn't coming into your pockets. And I, you know, I think that we need to be more, um, all of us on, um, need to be more clear about what the societal benefits are of that, because I think there really is a lot of missed opportunity there. Um, but one thing I wanted to raise, which is completely um, off the topic of any of the things that was on your slide, so it's a little bit embarrassing to bring it up. And I think it's something that I kind of like to see us do at an upcoming meeting of this committee. And that is that over the last year, the National Academy of Medicine has picked health and climate as among its grand challenges and is pursuing that uh, very vigorously. There are a lot of members of the Academy of Medicine as well as the other academies, science and engineering, 
that are seeing this as among our highest priorities. And in fact, the, the NAM is taking this issue on as a grand challenge. And I've had the opportunity actually to be able um, with them to talk to some of the new people coming into the White House Science Office, as well as others about the relevance of this, but also the importance of seeing funds come to health research around climate and health. It, you know, this isn't just about those of us in health giving lip service to the issue and helping to bolster a political agenda or something. They're very real environmental health issues uh, that are occurring and whether it connects to, you know, communicable diseases, um, food insecurity, um, economic insecurity around loss of um, livelihood with climate, as well as, you know, vector-borne diseases are just many, many aspects, but also issues around adaptation and the new materials that are being developed uh, to better um, insulate um, our homes to generate energy without um, generating carbon emissions. I don't think um, even the ideas around geoengineering um, and, um, and really huge land changes that could be occurring to our landscape that are a consequence of changing how we transmit energy, make batteries, use batteries. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a broad array of things. And, and I'm concerned that the NIEHS uh, really hasn't been uh, very engaged in this issue as a part of its core programs, you know, such as the National Toxicology Program and how it looks at materials. Uh, there are a lot of material consequences, um, as well as uh, as engaging, you know, with epidemiology and um, and and other kinds of um, activities scientifically that uh, that uh, we do very well in environmental health, but I don't think has been adequately applied. I think there's been a lot of support, you know, for these global assessments and for bringing the evidence together. And that is important. You guys are incredibly strong when it comes to doing systematic review and evidentiary assessment. But I, 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 I think there are opportunities to be part of, of generating that evidence. And I do see a lot of pressure now focused on NIH uh, proposals, for example, for a new institute that would do nothing but study climate and health. I mean, I kind of feel we have an Environmental Health Sciences Institute. Why would we need a separate one for looking at one environmental issue? But on the other hand, um, I can also see why people who feel strongly about this would be articulating that, just as you know, there's been so much pressure to create other individual institutes you know, for, for specific issues. So again, I, I'm pretty sure that this is an issue for discussion, you know, at some later meeting, but I just wanted to put that on your radar screen because I know that it's been, you know, definitely put on the radar screen of the new administration by lots of people. I, I, I will say, Rick, that I have been amazed by how many people in the National Academy of Medicine are interested in this issue not the usual four or five people that get together when I say, let's have an environmental health meeting. And it's all, you know, we, we had more than 50 people on a Zoom call from all kinds of areas in medicine who want to engage. And I, I just think that the time is right to figure out then, you know, what is the research agenda around this? So thank you. So Lynn, I, I'm really glad you brought this up and my, not talking about it and giving you an update to this meeting uh, doesn't mean that it's not on our radar screen. Um, it actually has, uh, it's, it's become prominently placed on our radar screen with the new administration. I mean, previously it was always one of those complicated topics that we couldn't talk about climate change um, as well as we couldn't talk about anti-racism, we couldn't talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Doesn't mean that we weren't doing things in the background. Now we can talk about this. And in fact, um, it's, it's been a, a big focus area for me. Actually, I'm gonna ask Jose to be prepared if he's in a position to make any comments uh, to, the, to the group. Uh, but suffice it to say, the, the Biden administration has made it clear that this, there is a very important health component to climate change. And it's something we've been interested in for quite a number of years. Uh, John, uh, John Belvis in our office of the director in Bethesda has been really a key catalyst for engaging several ICs and HHS in, in developing plans. Uh, 
but it can't be just, in my mind, it can't be just about NIHS. We can take a leadership role. It really has to be all of the ICs. I mean, all of the ICs should be interested in the health consequences of climate change. And furthermore, it shouldn't be just an institute of the NIH. I mean, I think that we need to be working across different federal agencies and then developing a comprehensive plan around all of the aspects of climate change. So let's embrace this now finally and start talking openly about developing uh, these comprehensive plans to take on this critically important problem. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have some progress to report the next time we have this meeting. And I know that, uh, uh, well, I, I just, I know that the, the Biden administration has been very interested in uh, promoting this type of work. And, uh, and suffice it to say, it's been a great interest to us here at NIHS. So stay tuned, Lynn, and stay tuned, everyone else. And let's see, Jose, is there anything that you want and you can tell us? Uh, or is, uh, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Uh, Rick, I appreciate it. And, and also thank you to Lynn for bringing the issue. Uh, uh, as some of you may know, I was uh, I served in the transition team under HHS uh, uh, for the Biden transition. And uh, we spent, and, and one of the major uh, uh, efforts is in, was in, in terms of uh, climate change. And it was uh, climate change, but also was an environmental justice. and uh, the effort and it's one of those uh, areas that you're going to hear more during the first hundred days and and um, it's great to see what we have heard so far and uh, to see how swiftly uh, things are moving and um, uh, but uh, what uh, Rick you brought up uh, this is an issue that's not in terms of one institute or even one agency and uh, what has been done and what I think you will see more is the role that EPA and, and multiple agencies, and it's not certainly EPA and NIH, but, but also from interior to basically, I think covers almost every agency, especially in the domestic side, but also including uh, a great deal of what hap it's happening in the uh, a more in the, uh, uh, the State Department and the international side. Um, so I think it is a great opportunity for both uh, bringing not only uh, uh, what needs to be done in research and Lynn uh, raised many of the issues, but also uh, is what can we do in terms of translating what we know and moving that forward uh, towards uh, a, having a greater uh, opportunity to uh, connect what needs to be done with climate and also with uh, our day, everyday lives. So let me leave it yeah, there. Jose, so, I, yeah, so thanks for the comments. And I mean, there's also the element of just uh, increasing awareness. I, I'm not sure that all of my colleagues, uh, division, I see directors across the NIH are aware of the, the health implications of climate change. I mean, they understand that there's an increased incidence of asthma and an increased incidence of you know, tick bites associated with um, you know, the different organisms, um, but connecting that with climate change and really bringing the health component to climate change to their awareness is something that we're, we're actively doing. And again, John uh, Balvis has been taking the lead. Uh, we have, uh, he's been working to, um, to promote a, there's a working group across several ICs and uh, and I, from my perspective is that, uh, again, it, it, it has to be more than just NIHS. We can take a lead on making sure that these things get nucleated and that we have the proper people who are sitting around the table and rolling up our sleeves and developing plans. But we also have a model that's called the National Toxicology Program, where it's not just the NIH, and that we ought to use that model and we ought to be selecting other relevant federal agencies and then putting together a, a working group to be taking this on. I mean, Andrew, uh, you know, we ought to have, we, be, we ought to be working with the EPA uh, as a very obvious example, as well as several other federal, federal, federal agencies, just to develop a more comprehensive plan is what is it we can be doing across different federal agencies? <laughs> Some of these may be related to remediation efforts, uh, but then also bringing the health aspects, you know, the NIH and other health-related organizations to the table. 
and to figure out what could be done. So Lynn, stay tuned. And uh, we hope to be able to be interfacing with the different National Academy panels. And again, in my, my mind, it all starts with a, a comprehensive plan. So let's get everyone around the table developing a plan of what is it we can each be doing to, uh, to produce some, uh, you know, some comprehensive plans so that we can make, uh, make an impact, both in the near term as well as in the longer term. I don't know if anyone saw 60 Minutes on Sunday, um, but Bill Gates apparently has taken on the issue of climate change in a very big way. So it's uh, just, it's very refreshing, just like with the issues of anti-racism, diversity, and equity, and inclusion, now that we can talk about this stuff, uh, it's, it's good that we can start rolling up our sleeves and developing plans and what do we do about it. We'll hear a little bit about that from Tara Schwetz uh, in her presentation uh, tomorrow afternoon. And, and if I may, Rick, so perhaps I, we should, and, yeah, go ahead. I should have mentioned this, but also I think your track record with the kind of work uh, that NIEHS has been able to do with communities and the very mm -hmm. important role of some of the most affected communities, the fact that there are co-benefits and that when we reduce carbon, we can be, but not necessarily are reducing pollution in the most affected communities should be trying to do that. And I think you're in an excellent position to contribute to that because of the work that many of your centers are doing with communities around the country that are affected. Um, they're getting the petrochemical emissions, but they also, they're not necessarily seeing a reduction in those emissions when they're carbon reductions. It just depends on how it's done. So anyway. Well, it's another good point, Lynn. Uh, I personally think that NIHS is really leading the way across the NIH on community engagement and how to do this. And unfortunately, some of the other institutes are realizing that they're behind the curve and that uh, with the community engagement, lack of community engagement on the whole COVID testing and the vaccination you know, is problematic. So uh, we know how to do this. And I know that our acting deputy director, Gwen Coleman, working together with others here at NIHS has been very actively involved in the, it's called the RADx Up for underrepresented populations. You know, getting our testing strategies out there to the upper underrepresented communities and bringing some of the best practices that uh, our grantees have established. Gwen, do you want to just comment on this? I know that you've, you've been working evenings, weekends, and pretty pretty much continuously on getting the word out on what we do on community engagement. Well, within the context of COVID-19, um, two major programs from the NIH really focus on the burden uh, in the communities of color and have a very, very strong community engagement approach. One is RADx Up, which is the goal is to uh, increase testing, increase the reach, increase the uh, the um, the uh, uptake of all of testing in these communities and also get some of the new tests um, out in those communities. And of course, now with the availability of vaccines, the opportunity to pivot some of that work, to look at testing within the context of a vaccine distribution. There's another program called um, Community Engagement Alliance for COVID-19. And this is a program um, in 11 states currently, and I think is seeking to expand to um, another number of states across the country. And here uh, it's to uh, work on uh, working with communities and having strategies to uh, include people of color in uh, research related to COVID therapeutics, vaccines, et cetera, but also to uh, now work on uh, vaccine hesitancy and uptake, uh, looking at things like um, misinformation and building community trust, really all for the goals of um, providing uh, health uh, disparities lens and improving the health COVID related health. We have a couple of people from NIEHS who have been awarded RADx Up programs. Um, I'm seeing Irva on my little screen here. She is the director of one of the COVID RADx Up programs. It'd be great to hear from her uh, about how that's going and the impact that she's being able to have in her region in California. It's very exciting, fast moving program. And uh, you know, I think we hope that it will have a lot of impact across the country. Great. Actually, before Rick, we hear from Irva, I, I want to make sure that um, we have, what, about five more minutes left for Q&A. Yeah, so, Rick, are there I, other unrelated questions? I'm sorry, was I, someone? 
Yeah, Dr. Korfmacher's had her hand up for a while, virtual hand up for a while. So can we? Oh, uh, Katrina, go her? ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And Irva, just stay tuned. If we have some time, we can make, uh, get your comments on here. So go ahead, Katrina. Sure. <clears throat> so I um, posed this comment in response to your request for feedback on the values. I tried to um, respond to that. And I was thinking of it in terms of Jalan's and Trevor's comments on Shri's presentation, but it turns out to be really relevant to what Lynn said as well, which I, I really um, heartily endorse. So I was thinking about how those five values guide us towards the overall goal of addressing environmental public health problems and contributing to health equity. Because how NIH has prioritizes its limited resources is key. And that begs the question of who's involved in setting those priorities and how. So Billy Angelon and Trevor's comments, how can communities and workers at risk of exposure to chemicals help prioritize which chemicals are studied? That was a great example. And I think that's reflected in how we define innovation. So is the primary focus on the latest technology as innovation, or do we also include low-tech transformative programs that translate and disseminate low-cost interventions through lay-level implementers like community health workers, or by research that informs dissemination and implementation of local environmental health policies and programs? So in other words, how does innovation lead to impact on health equity, and how can we make that line as short and direct as possible? So how can we build those values of collaboration and distributed leadership into prioritizing research that efficiently and effectively promotes environmental health equity? So that also those values of workforce diversification, diversification, open communication, collaboration, distributed leadership, all those to me suggest a broadly participatory process for defining what innovation is, and setting priorities. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about how to operationalize that, either at the within FOA level, like John, Lon and Trevor were suggesting, or at a very macro level, uh, like Lynn's question, and, and maybe your comment about the NTP starts to get at that. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Okay, well, that, that's pretty loaded. <laughs> um, and I'm very pleased. I, I think what, what I'm hearing from you is that these five different leadership values uh, when you package them all up together, it, it actually makes sense and really gives us a way to implement. Uh, now, the first thing I want to, to address is the issue of, implement, of, of innovation. So in my mind, this innovation leadership value is not just about new technologies. It could be about innovative new ways to take existing technologies, but to implement the existing technologies uh, to make programs happen that have innovative impacts on communities. So it's not just about new testing strategies, but I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely committed to the, uh, the shared leadership, um, you know, getting your input. And it's similar to what we did for our, for our uh, strategic planning effort. So it's not just about Rick sitting in my office, you know, writing down the things that we need to be doing, but using back in uh, 2011, soon after I got here, um, using the open space format, you know, getting input from uh, all of you across the, the uh, environmental health sciences community. What are the things that you think are really important and that we need to be thinking about as we make decisions about funding priorities for environmental health science? So, and then the workforce diversity. So these, all things, these, these factor together. But, but how do you make it happen? So in my mind, it's you. It's, so you make it happen through the the themes and the goals of the strategic plan. So take a look. I think our in my mind the the, the things that you've raised are actually defined in our strategic plan. But I want to take a look at those goals, and as we look at the goal, we remind ourselves continuously of these five themes. And then implement on these goals according to the themes to make things happen. So does that? I mean, I could go on here, but then in the interest of time, we're running out of time. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Good. Well, I'm really glad that that was a very, very comprehensive assessment of of, of where these leadership values really come to play in making things happen within the life sciences, uh, in the environmental health sciences community. So thank you, uh, Katrina. And I see that uh, Shuk May has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on this outstanding agenda. Um, two of the things I'd like to brought up is, we love. I love to see this global co collaboration 
and I hope that you will elaborate that going forward in the coming meetings. The second thing is about this um, COVID, post-COVID time. And we have to use a lot of innovations that we already are using right now because it has compressed our innovation cycle. So that will allow us to actually generate a lot of digital or remote uh, sensing or remote uh, mediation, remediations and detection methods that really will actually benefit a lot of the communities that we were unable to reach out uh, in the past. So those are a couple of thoughts that I have, and I'm just going to, um, you know, um, turn the microphone back to you. Well, I just shook me before before we go on. I see that Terry just raised his hand. Um, one thing I'm personally very passionate about is getting it, the discussion about environmental exposures into the whole discussion about COVID impacts. And it's, you know, Tony Fauci and others are not talking about the types of environmental exposures that may be impacting individuals' variability in their responses to an infection. I mean, we know that PFAS, we know that air pollution, we know that there's a whole variety of different environmental exposures that can be compromising the immune system and maybe compromising the individual's ability to raise a response to the vaccine. So we've got to, and, and, and rest assured, I'm going to work my best to get these concepts and these ideas using, I think, what, what Lynn originally called the, what is it, scientific statesmanship. So I'm going to get out there and I'm going to work on this and just bring into people's consciousness. Um, the importance of looking at environmental exposures. So we, we got to continue to get it out there. So Terry, you had your hand up. Yeah, just a quick comment. I think it's really important, as people have said, and you've said, to be able to reach across to other agencies, federal agencies, uh, private industry, and other uh, community groups and whatever, to try and make sure that uh, all of these issues are, are uh, encountered, if you will, by, by people working on this a uh, really huge uh, problem that we have with uh, global climate change. And I'm thinking um, especially things like food insecurity and uh, water insecurity and other things that could have huge effects on people's health uh, that oftentimes um, seem to be, you know, sort of ethereal, but are, are clearly uh, real threats. Um, and so there's so many other agencies that could be engaged to help uh, work on these problems. And so I applaud you, Rick, for, for doing this and, uh, sort of a serious inventory of all the different things would be very helpful for those of us out in the, in the uh, research community to be able to come up with ideas to help out with this. Great. Well, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll stay in touch with you on that. And, um, and you know, actually, in the meantime, we do have the National Toxicology Program. I think as Lynn, I think Lynn commented that um, we, the National Toxicology Program needs to be looking at some of the, the exposures and the things that are happening as a consequence of climate change. So we're working through, and at, at a later meeting, I'll report back on some of the strategic planning that's going on uh, with the National Toxicology Program and uh, better defining how we can be working more effectively together with other uh, federal agencies. So stay tuned on that, and we look forward to making progress. So I, are there any other raised hands? I see that we're running over time. But if there are other questions, any burning questions? So, Pat, do you see any other raised hands? Uh, I don't see any, no. Uh, you had talked Irva, about... Uh, Irva, did Irva, you want to make a comment, uh, quickly make a comment about your, your program? Sure, yeah, very quickly. Uh, it, it's really quite exciting. We, <clears throat> we have a, a, a group of 10, <clears throat> sorry, 10 community uh, organizations that are working with us uh, to really roll out. Uh, we have these two vans, mobile testing site vans, that are uh, circulating in uh, four counties in the Central Valley in California, where the po you know the, the the predominant population you know 50, 60 percent of the of the population in those counties is uh, is Hispanic, and uh, there there are all kinds of organizations. Some of them are environmental. Some of them are like immigrants' rights. Uh, some of them are uh, working in just other spaces around around those issues. And uh, one of them is a, is a radio station, a Spanish language radio station that covers uh, pretty much all up and down the Central Valley of California. So uh, it's, it's really been a very, a very 
strong response from those organizations and we're busy figuring out whether what are the obstacles and just at the last meeting we heard that that one of the uh, faith leaders is, has been discouraging people from getting vaccines. So uh, we, we've come up with a plan for trying to uh, talk to actually his bishop um, because of some other connections that, that uh, community groups and some of our own investigators actually have. Uh, so it, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's a big area and we're, we're not going to, you know, completely ourselves turn it around, but I think we're going to fill the gaps uh, by doing a lot of Saturdays and Sundays and evenings and times when working people can't actually get to the testing sites that uh, tend to be open mostly just, you know, hours of eight to five. Um, lots, of, lots of complicated issues. And I can also quickly comment that Irva and I, as well as other members of the environmental health sciences community, recently had an opportunity to uh, brief Congress uh, on some of the challenges with wildfires and climate change. So there, and I predict that we will have many other opportunities to, to bring the health component of climate change to the awareness of our legislators in Washington. As well as Irva and I have, have talked about some of the challenges of bringing the, you know, the whole health issue to uh, maybe some of our colleagues in the medical schools uh, across the, the different uh, you know, universities in the United States. So we'll keep working on it. And uh, so thanks, Lynn, for, for bringing up that whole topic area. So stay tuned. Okay, Pat, I think we should probably go on. We're running a bit over time. I believe Brian was going to, can you hear me okay? We can hear yeah, you, Brian. and I think Brian is up yep. to introduce uh, one of his yes. investigators. Yep. All righty, thank you. I'm here, thanks, Pat. Um, so um, thank you, that was actually a really good conversation. I'm going to look forward to uh, following up some of the threads that got introduced there. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next presentation and put a little context around it, which I'll try to do briefly since we are running short of time. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Nicole Kleinstroy, who's the acting director of the NTP Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods, which is affectionately known as NICETAM. It has a primary mission to support what we affectionately call ICVAM, or the Interagency Coordinating Committee for the Validation of Alternative Methods with a primary mission towards um, uh, facilitating the adoption of, uh, of non-animal approaches to um, essentially the kinds of things that we do, which are hazard assessments, characterizations. NICEDEM is uh, within the division of the National Toxicology Program, as you all recognize, with three uh, fundamental missions. One, to um, identify and characterize hazards. Another is to develop novel tools and approaches, which is obviously NICEDEM and ICFAM fall within that scope. And the third is advancing our understanding of how xenobiotics inter interact with biological systems. Nicole is uh, giving a presentation that she has entitled Computationally Augmented Intelligence for Predictive Toxicology. And I just absolutely love that title. Computationally Augmented Intelligence just sounds better than, than AI. Predictive toxicology is where we're trying to put more emphasis in our, uh, in our program. Um, again, as many of you recognize, she's going to present the, the concept of a comp Comp tox continuum, which I also really enjoy, um, and and uh, and I think uh, you'll get some interesting insights from that. Recognizing that many of our tools are are things that we use in, in integrated ways. So in toxicology, um, historically we've been very reliant on on animal studies to um, identify and characterize the hazards that we all care about. Um, it has done us um, um, has. I think stood in good stead in, in helping us to advance our understanding of, of things that we need to, um, to mitigate in our environment. And I think we've also all recognized that it's not a very efficient way to um, address the growing number of uh, hazards in our environment that we're concerned about. And some of the climate related things that we're talking about, I think are perfect examples of that. So we have been um, in search of developing uh, novel approaches. And over the last decade or so, we've gotten really, really good at generating a lot of high throughput mechanistic kind of data. Where we've struggled a little bit is actually relating that uh, high throughput mechanistic data to uh, in vivo outcomes, although we've made some progress there. Nicole and her group um, have, have um, largely focused on developing some infrastructure that I think is gonna be critical in helping us to bridge 
that very mechanistic bioactivity kind of information to um, outcomes that uh, ultimately we care about and will mitigate. So that's what she's going to talk about today. I think you're in for a, a great ride. Um, Nicole does an incredible job, but you need to um, latch your seat belts because she's going to she's going to share a lot with you here over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So with that, Nicole, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay and see me okay. Yes, we can. Thanks, Nathan. All right, so uh, it's a real privilege to be here today to talk to you about what we do. Um, as Brian indicated, my primary appointment is as the director of NICETAM. I also have a secondary appointment in the Division of Intramural Research, Biostatistics and Computational Biology branch. So NICETAM is a part of the division of the National Toxicology Program here at NIEHS. And as Brian already explained, uh, is essentially the US federal resource for alternatives to animal testing. So our primary role is to provide support to ICVAM, which was established uh, just over 20 years ago. So in December of 2000, so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary as a congressionally mandated committee of agencies that either require or consider chemical safety testing data and are interested in replacing or reducing or supplementing traditional animal-based approaches with more rapid, human-relevant, uh, mechanistically informative methods. So as you can see, uh, ICVAM agencies are sort of loosely divided between your typical regulatory partners that you would think of normally when you're in the chemical safety space like EPA or FDA, um, but also a number of research agencies. And this includes NIEHS and several, several other NIH ICs. Um, and in addition to NICETAM's support of ICFAM more broadly, we also work very closely with our intramural partners in the Division of the National Toxicology Program and the Intramural Research Division to develop and validate alternatives. And we have a very strong focus on computational approaches. Um, I think that this has really come to the forefront in the last decade. Um, these activities have benefited tremendously from the rapid maturation of computational power and cognitive algorithms like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and we've contributed along with the broader scientific community to the development of a large array of computational tools and workflows that allow us to mine and process and curate and model big data to really facilitate robust and reliable predictions of chemical property, activity, and toxicity endpoints. So I'll be speaking to you today about um, an, some examples of the work that we're doing in that space. So that concept is fundamentally augmented intelligence. And so this is a slightly broader concept than what people typically think of when they think of AI. And so this is a field that leverages big data and computational tools to join the techniques of typical AI, machine learning, natural language processing, mathematical modeling, uh, data analytics, with really the goal of enhancing and supporting human intellect. So um, this concept was first published in a series of seminal papers in the late 50s and early 60s. And it, it really goes well beyond the typical definition of AI as artificial intelligence, as that process of building um, a human-like intelligence in the form of an autonomous technological system like a computer or a robot. Um, and, and it augmented intelligence encompasses AI and really the rest of our technological toolbox to improve upon an autonomous intelligence, human beings that have already proven to function um, for better or for worse, depending on how many cups of coffee we've had that day. So the concept of augmented intelligence underpins really the cycle of modern toxicology and environmental health sciences. Um, which is what I like to call the, the computational toxicology or comp tox continuum, which I have pictured here. Um, and this, this diagram uh, was born initially as sort of a back of the napkin drawing um, that I then turned over to our talented artists at Multimedia Services that made it much prettier and much more polished looking. And this 
really uh, represents kind of an interconnected cycle between the fundamental components of um, environmental health sciences and, and toxicology and predictive toxicology. And the interconnectivity of all of these different components I think to some people often appears kind of antithetical to a common misconception, which is that there are sort of two competing approaches to modern toxicology or drug discovery. Um, on the one hand, you have the philosophy of, well, we should really focus exclusively on the you know, biological knowledge and our expert-based understanding of systems and pathways and build testing strategies based exclusively on that. And then you have kind of the big data crowd, which just says, okay, let's just generate as much data as possible and throw it in at the machines and the machines will sort it out and build predictive models that will solve all of our problems. And I don't think that those are at their heart actually conflicting concepts. I think that success really lies in leveraging both of those philosophies using an augmented intelligence approach that is iterative and continuous and mutually informative along this continuum of what are known as fair data resources. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Um, feeding into predictive analyses, experimentation, study design, building mechanistic models and systems models, ultimately with the goal of allowing that iterative continuum to help us generate insights into human disease processes and their susceptibility to environmental perturbations, which will ultimately support effective environmental health research and decision-making. So this concept of FAIR, um, for every aspect of data and data resources is really fundamental to the success of this process. And FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these tenants have really been uh, taken up and championed by NIH at essentially every level, both intramurally and extramurally in the last few years. And these principles apply not only to data sets, but also to data objects like code, uh, so algorithms that are used to analyze data and build predictive models, uh, metadata, um, databases that store different data objects. And the concepts here is, are that these findable objects should be accessible by both humans and machines and curated and annotated in a fashion that they become interoperable and reusable so that you can join multiple data sets from multiple different sources into larger supersets of data that will really allow us to leverage our computational tools most effectively. But converting resources, you know, important data sets and important um, information into a fair format is really not always easy or straightforward. So I think one really good example is historical reference data. So as Brian already um, stated, animal studies have served us well for decades. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of animal studies that have been run. And it's really important for us to be able to collect and curate all of that information and join it together into computationally accessible formats to allow us to process it, to understand it, to model it, and in my field in particular, to validate new non-animal alternatives that are intended to predict the same biological endpoints. So here you can see an image of the validation workflow for most alternatives, which really relies upon the curation of reliable reference data from regulatory standard test methods that are currently used. But those studies and that information are typically found in PDFs, um, which best case scenario are machine readable, uh, more often than not are scanned documents or they're lost somewhere in a file cabinet in 1987. And they need to be manually curated to kind of identify those high quality studies and to extract relevant information from those studies. And I probably don't have to tell you that that manual curation is a pretty painful process sometimes. It's very, very resource intensive. So one example of a, a manual curation process um, to establish a reference database 
is a project that we undertook in support of the US EPA's endocrine disruptor screening program, where we wanted to establish a reference database of rodent uterotrophic studies to try and derive a set of in vivo reference chemicals that could be used to validate alternatives. So the uterotrophic rodent bioassay is the regulatory standard method of determining whether or not a chemical has estrogenic properties. So you take um, sexually immature or overectomized rats or mice um, that don't produce their own endogenous estrogens and you expose them to chemicals that may be acting as exogenous estrogens and then measure uterine cell hypertrophy as the, the outcome. So, we started with a literature search to identify over 700 papers that looked like uterotrophic studies. And then we assessed their adherence to certain minimum criteria that were derived from regulatory guideline study protocols. And so these are criteria such as, uh, did they use the correct animal model? Did they have a high enough number of animals in each dose group to ensure statistical power, et cetera. And so once we had evaluated, so once we had extracted all of the protocol information and then evaluated whether or not these studies um, adhered to those minimum criteria and would be considered you know, guideline-like studies, then we could use that subset of high quality studies to identify a set of in vivo reference chemicals that had reproducible results that were then used to validate um, an alternative model. So in this case, it was an in vitro assay-based testing strategy that was known as the ToxCast ER pathway model. So um, in brief, it's just a, a relatively simple computational model that combines information from multiple in vitro assays along the estrogen receptor signaling pathway from binding to transactivation to receptor dependent proliferation and provides an overall kind of weight of evidence assessment of whether a chemical is estrogenic or not. So this was a very successful project. Um, when we narrowed it down to the very high quality studies from which we could derive those reference chemicals, um, the model performed exceptionally well over 95% predictive accuracy and it was validated and is now accepted by the EPA as a replacement for the rodent uterotrophic assay and more recently has been accepted in Europe by uh, ECHA and EFSA, the European Chemicals Agency and Food Safety Authority, as actually the preferred data source for indicating an estrogenic modality for chemicals. So very successful project, obviously, um, but since my team spent like two years at least on curating this data set, we thought, well, can we repurpose this? Can we take it and use it uh, for something else and, and make it bigger than just this initial project? So to put this valuable resource to further use, we teamed up with Oak Ridge National Laboratories to use it as a training set for applying natural language processing and machine learning to try and automate the process of identifying high quality guideline studies in the literature. Um, and so here we've taken two different approaches. So the first approach is um, a fully supervised approach where we use the training set to train classifier models for each of those minimum criteria from the study protocols, um, and then combine those into ensemble models to predict the guideline length -like studies. And then the second approach is a more unsupervised approach where we actually extract text segments relevant to those criteria descriptions and then classify the extracted segments. And this approach leverages um, biomedical contextual word vectors that are sort of capable of distinguishing different meanings of the same word. So distinguishing cases where a chemical is used as an experimental treatment versus part of a laboratory procedure. And this project, which is underway right now, has demonstrated really excellent performance um, against the training set, so cross-validated performance when looking at the, the models and their ability to predict those high quality studies from within the uterotrophic database. And that's all very well and good, but now we want to apply it prospectively to a new study type. So uh, we're working with the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicity Working Group um, from ICVAM, which is a collection of experts, um, including uh, Susie Fitzpatrick, who's on the line right now, and other DART experts um, from across the different federal agencies 
to try and um, create a corpus of published developmental talk studies and then use this code that was trained on the eutrophic set to actually automatically rank these studies by study quality, identify subsets of guideline-like studies, extract those results, and use those to select reference compounds with reproducible outcomes and facilitate other analyses like looking at species specific effects or incidents of different potentially more subtle outcomes, looking at animal test reproducibility, et cetera. Um, so that's a really exciting project that's ongoing. Um, then once those high quality studies have been identified, obviously that information needs to be extracted. So the automation of the first piece of that pipeline is already valuable. So you're cutting down the amount of manual effort and resources you have to apply by you know, being able to focus on that subset of high quality studies. But can we take that further and actually automate the extraction of information in terms of results and treatment related effects? And this is a huge challenge. Um, often results are located in tables or in figures. Um, when you're extracting methods information, that's usually in free text in a specific part of the paper. But results are much more heterogeneous, much more variable. So again, uh, we've partnered with other offices within the DNTP um, and with ORNL, again, to actually automate the process of kind of treating PDF documents as images and using deep learning and image analysis to automate, automatically recognize those tables, break down those tables using OCR or optimal character recognition, extract that text, then post-process and reconstruct those tables in a computationally accessible format. And we're making great progress in that area as well. So once that information has been extracted, either manually as we're doing it currently or in the future, potentially automatically, the next critical step is to try and translate the original language that was used to describe those effects into standardized terms that are both human and machine interpretable. So this involves the use of controlled vocabularies and ontologies. And here we've been working with the systems toxicology branch and taking all of the legacy developmental toxicity prenatal studies that the National Toxicology Program has run over the last several decades and extracting all of that information into a structured, computable, searchable database, um, and then taking the original language from those primary source extractions, so the ways that the toxicologists described um, the effects that were seen as a result of chemical treatment, and mapping those words to actual controlled terminologies and vocabularies so that the computer can understand that when someone says that they observed an increase in fetuses with small eyes, that's the same as another toxicologist saying that there was an increase in the incidence of microphthalmia or an increase in reduced eye size, which to a human, those are all equivalent. To a computer, they're all different unless you have controlled vocabularies and ontologies that you're using to map. And so we've, we've developed um, code to actually automate those mapping. And it's, it's sort of a plug and play type of an approach. It's not necessarily specific to developmental talk studies. Um, you can substitute in your own uh, user-defined synonym lists, your own controlled vocabularies and terminologies, and that code will help map those primary source language extractions to these controlled vocabularies. So really the ultimate goal is to have kind of a fully automated pipeline from high quality study identification to information extraction, to curation and annotation, to feed into databases and web portals where these data can be stored and accessed and combined to fully leverage our computational capabilities and predictive modeling approaches. And these um, efforts are going on at multiple scales within the Institute um, and in a harmonized fashion with our federal partners like EPA and our international partners like ECHA. So, our specific effort uh, in this space, when I say our, I mean NICETAM's specific effort uh, in terms of building a resource to store FAIR data is called ICE, so the Integrated Chemical Environment. Um, and this is a dashboard that is web accessible and it's designed to really provide intuitive access to high quality curated data 
and tools to support chemical evaluations, data integration, informatics analyses, and model development. And our intention here is to try and um, democratize access to these resources and really to enable the wider scientific community to engage in the use of alternatives and computational approaches for assessing chemical safety. So what do we have in ICE? Um, we have a wide range of reference data sets, of computational models, of established reference chemical lists from validation studies. Um, the data sets that we have encompass in vivo data, so uh, data that's been curated from those systematic literature review efforts like the one that I just mentioned, um, but also that's been downloaded and curated from other databases like SEBS or like um, the EPA's ToxRefDB. Uh, we have quite a bit of in vitro data. Um, we have a curated version of the high throughput screening data from the Tox21 federal research program. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, how we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to annotate those high throughput screening assays with their mechanistic targets to provide sort of biological context for those who may not be as familiar with those screening platforms. And all of our data sets can be merged with one another. Um, so you can look at the available data for, for example, acute systemic toxicity or eye irritation or inhalation effects and merge that with in vitro data platforms or high throughput screening data. We also have um, a fairly large set of data on mixtures. And then we have a whole suite of computational tools. So our computational tools are browser-based, they're open access, there's nothing to install. Um, we have a pipeline called in vitro to in vivo extrapolation where users can actually translate in vitro activity concentrations to the predicted external exposures that would be required to achieve plasma level or tissue level concentrations that are equivalent to those where activity is seen in in vitro assays. And users can run that with data within ICE, within our database, or they can actually supply their own data. So if they have a, a data set of in vitro concentrations and they want to translate that to predicted external exposures, uh, they can do that without having to run any code. It's a very uh, user-friendly interface. And then the results of that IVIVE workflow can also be compared and contrasted with actual external doses from animal studies in our database. We also have a chemical characterization tool that allows comparison between things like distribution of physical chemical properties. It allows you to do principal component analyses and project multiple chemical spaces onto one another. And all of these tools, wherever possible, are connected with other important resources like the EPA's chemical uh, Comtox dashboard. Um, so specific to the high throughput screening data, as I mentioned, we've spent a lot of time and energy sort of curating that data to incorporate both uh, biological context, but also chemical QC information. So uh, for those of you not familiar, you know, the TOX21 screening program has screened almost 10,000 chemicals in anywhere from 100 to 1,000 different in vitro assays that span a huge range of technology platforms, including things like small model organisms like zebrafish. Um, and those uh, assays, you know, really require, I think, a pretty in-depth understanding of those technology platforms to use them effectively. So we wanted to change that. So now we've mapped all of the assay targets to things like um, biological processes, mechanistic targets, modes of action, and then we've linked those to controlled terminologies and ontologies like the NCI, Metathesaurus, and uh, gene ontology processes. And then there's also the chemical QC information. So all 10,000 chemicals have analytical QC methods that tell us whether or not the chemical was actually in the well when it was being tested, whether it has long-term shelf stability, et cetera. And so any chemicals that failed QC, we've actually um, put a flag on top of that data and kind of removed those low confidence values and let the user know um, that this is a chemical QC omit issue. They can still see the data that's behind it, but we just don't want folks um, doing assessments or building models on potentially unreliable data. So something else that ICE has is um, 
QSAR model predictions, so quantitative structure activity relationship predictions for over 800,000 chemicals. So we have a, a really tremendous um, chemical informatics program. So we have a, a computational chemistry lead, Kamel Mansouri, who has, uh, working with the EPA and some of our other partners, led the development of OPERA, which is the Open Structure Activity Proper Property Relationship app. And it's a suite of QSAR models, so in silico models that take chemical structure and physicochemical properties and predict some sort of endpoint. And those endpoints range from physicochemical and environmental fate parameters to properties that um, affect things like physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. So uh, plasma protein binding or intrinsic hepatic clearance or tissue partition coefficient inputs. Um, we also have models for certain toxicity endpoints, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, so all of these models are available either via ICE. So we've run 800,000 chemicals through all of the models and you can get those predictions through the ICE dashboard. Or um, if you would like to run these on, for example, proprietary or new structures, um, Opera is actually available for download from the NIEHS GitHub, and you can download that and run that uh, behind your firewall, for example. Um, and all of the models in Opera follow best practices for QSAR and machine learning modeling in general. And although these best practices, which are represented here in this figure, are pretty standardized, I wanted to highlight that it's, they're not necessarily uniform across all applications and endpoints. So at every step in this workflow, there are a number of different choices that can be made in terms of how you clean your data, how you curate your data, um, approaches for imputation of missing data, your choice of structural descriptors, molecular features, physicochemical property descriptors, um, how you split your data, your feature selection approaches, which machine learning algorithms you want to use for which types of applications, how to combine them, how to train and test your models. Um, so recognizing that there are many different sort of correct ways to follow these best practices, uh, when we have built models to predict more complex endpoints like toxicity endpoints, we have tried to do what I affectionately call computationally crowdsourcing the collective. So we recognize that while we have a tremendous uh, modeling team in house, we're not the only game in town. There are many groups across the world that have excellent programs in applying machine learning and artificial intelligence and building QSAR and QSPR models. And each approach using their favorite descriptor set or their favorite algorithm or combination of algorithms has strengths and weaknesses. So taking this crowdsourcing approach and actually putting out a training set of data to multiple different groups around the world, and then taking those models back in house, evaluating those on external test sets and doing both a quantitative and a qualitative assessment, and then combining those models into ensemble consensus-based approaches um, really leverages the strengths and compensates for the weaknesses of any individual method. And Furthermore, you know, any individual method is going to have an applicability domain where you know, the, the predictions are reliable. And in general, that's not gonna cover your entire chemical universe. But when you combine over a hundred models, which is what we've done in pretty much each of these projects from groups worldwide, um, from Europe, the US, Latin America, Canada, Asia, um, from academic groups, industry, federal agency partners like EPA and DOD. So when you combine over a hundred different models, you actually end up getting complete coverage of the entire chemical universe within the applicability domain of multiple models, which no single approach can really provide to you. Um, so the examples that we have highlighted here are for endocrine endpoints. So um, the Toxcast ER pathway model that I mentioned previously, where we had data on over a thousand chemicals um, across many different points in the biological pathway. We had a similar androgen receptor pathway model, and those data sets were used as training data for the SIRAP and the Compara projects. 
Um, most recently, we finished up a project called the Collaborative Acute Toxicity Modeling Suite, or CATMOS, where we collected acute oral systemic LD50 data on over 10,000 chemicals and um, provided that data to groups all over the world and got back over 140 different models that were combined into an ensemble consensus-based prediction and is now available through OPERA and is being assessed by different regulatory agencies for use in their um, risk assessment applications. Actually, our next um, application of this global collaborative uh, crowdsourcing approach is actually going to be inhalation toxicity. Um, so I was very interested by the discussion earlier around the concept that Shri presented um, and some of the comments that we received with respect to leveraging public-private partnerships, which is exactly what this is, and in silico modeling to try and prioritize agents um, which pose in this case, an acute inhalation systemic toxicity risk. So that's the, we're in the data curation phase of that right now. And then we're gonna be moving into that collaborative project. So that might be a point of connection where we could help to um, prioritize those agents for which medical countermeasures may need to be developed. Um, so work that began during the CATMOS project um, has been further extended. Uh, and this is just a specific example of something that I get to do. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to do when wearing my intramural research hat. So it's more of a computational methods development project. Um, so with our partners at NCATS um, and UNC Chapel Hill, we took a model of a deep learning consensus based architecture that was developed during that CATMOS acute toxicity prediction project um, to predict rat oral LD50s and then further extended that to predict the acute systemic toxicity of multiple species using an approach called multitask modeling. Um, so here this combines that deep learning consensus architecture that uses both descriptor based and descriptor free models with graph convolutional neural networks, um, which briefly sort of, they construct learned molecular representations by operating on the graph structure of the molecule with multitask deep neural networks to develop a consensus model that's actually able to predict understudied but biologically related endpoints. So in this case, LD50s in other species like dogs or avian species, um, where the individual data sets would be too small to uh, train effectively um, single task machine learning models. So um, that's, that's kind of a, an exciting kind of methods development project that we're working on that I think has a lot of potential application to other areas as well. Um, also under my intramural appointment, we focus on tool development in using the TOX21 high throughput screening data to build models such as uh, interference prediction or interpred. So um, this is particularly useful for assay developers um, who are using common technology platforms like luciferase inhibition or fluorescence readouts. And this takes a data set of 10,000 chemicals, which were specifically measured um, for whether or not they would interfere with uh, luciferase inhibition or cause autofluorescence in red, green, or blue wavelengths under various cell culture conditions, and uses that 10,000 compound data set as a training set to build multiple QSAR machine learning based models, which are then combined in a consensus approach. And so it allows for users to upload their own chemical sets, and then predict whether those chemicals are likely to interfere with those common assay technology platforms. Um, another tool that we've built using the TOX21 data um, that's again intended to facilitate the scientific community to develop hypotheses uh, using this rich data set is TOX21 body map, where we've mapped in vitro assay targets to the tissues in the body where those genes that the assays are targeting are preferentially expressed. So this allows for hypothesis generation about target tissues where a chemical might cause biological activity um, based on their patterns of effects in almost a thousand high throughput screening assays. 
And these tools are all interactive, all web-based. Um, and for this particular tool, there's the ability for the user to kind of change the cutoffs of activity concentration. So if you're looking at a specific chemical and you said, oh, well, I, I really only care about activity that happens at sub-micromolar concentrations. Um, you can set that threshold. You can also change the tissue gene expression level that's um, deemed significant. So if you only care about tissues where your genes are expressed at tenfold above baseline, um, based on the average expression across the body, you can change that threshold as well. Um, and this is currently based on tissue level gene expression from the next bio database. And uh, this is, you know, provided based on averages across the population. Um, but, you know, whenever I hear Dr. Wojciech speak, you know, I always think about sort of how we could expand this work and you could see, you know, in the future, being able to specifically represent different genetic backgrounds and sensitive subpopulations um, with their specific tissue level gene expressions and trying to predict how environmental exposures and chemicals might preferentially uh, affect those individuals from those populations as well. Um, and then the, the last tool that I'll talk about um, that's, that's again available online, that's something that I've, I've done as part of my intramural um, assign, or, uh, intramural uh, project has been uh, ChemMaps. So ChemMaps is what we like to call sort of the Google Maps of the chemical universe. Um, so this allows the user to kind of go in and explore chemical space. So we have multiple different maps available. So the drug map looks at um, chemicals and mo molecules that have been developed as potential pharmaceuticals or accepted pharmaceuticals or so around 12,000 entries from the drug bank database. The DSS tox map has over 800,000 environmental chemicals in it, and you can look at pieces of that environmental chemical universe at a, at a time. Um, and then we have two other specific maps that were uh, requested by our stakeholders because they wanted to be able to see where their compounds might fall with respect to tox 21 or to the universe of known perfluorinated substances. So users can, first of all, choose different properties to highlight on these maps. So when you look at an interactive um, interface and look at the different chemical structures and where they fall, you can also look at things like toxicity values or physicochemical properties in an interactive information panel. And then users can upload their own chemical list and project that onto particular maps to analyze specific chemical neighborhoods. So, um, under Dr. Wojciech and Dr. Berridge's leadership, uh, the DNTP has really set out to build this program that really fully leverages and applies all of our capabilities in um, deliberate, integrated, and complementary ways along this translational toxicology pipeline. Um, and that goes from data knowledge mining to in silico and in vitro approaches to in vivo testing and to, in, to use all of that knowledge in really a comprehensive fashion to improve our understanding about how environmental agents affect human health and disease pathways. So I've shown you just a few examples today of tools that we're building that map to almost every aspect of this pipeline. I say almost because um, the, the chronic in vivo studies um, has a little coming soon star associated with it. So we have a new release of ICE that's coming out next month in March, uh, version 3.3. Um, which brings some really cool new tools, uh, allowing for deep dives into the concentration response plots from the high throughput screening data, new visualizations of activity profiles, both across and within groups of chemicals, but it will also bring new data sets. Um, so we have been working hard to curate data sets for things like chronic cancer, developmental tox, reproductive talks, et cetera. Um, so that, that new update will have a, a lot of new features, including information on chronic in vivo studies. So in the last few minutes that I have, um, I'd like to end with a specific example of applying augmented intelligence along this translational toxicology pipeline, uh, specifically to support the DNTP's efforts to understand environmental contributions to cardiovascular disease, uh, which, as you all know, is a major cause of, of death and disability worldwide. It's one of the three health effect innovation initiatives that NTP has undertaken. 
And it's, it's really um, also emblematic, I think, of the larger shift in the NTP's approach, which was historically more of an agent-centric focus where someone nominated a chemical or a group of chemicals, and then we'd run a bunch of animal studies um, to try and get information about how that chemical was affecting biological systems. And a shift in that focus to a more mechanistically driven uh, focus where we're trying to develop a more comprehensive understanding of human disease mechanisms and pathways and their susceptibility to environmental perturbations. Um, so here we have uh, used the TOX21 data to try and prioritize environmental chemicals with significant activity against what are known as cardiovascular failure modes. So these are things like uh, changes in action potential, changes in vasoactivity, um, injury and proliferation of uh, endothelial cells, coagulation pathways. And so we um, prioritized the high throughput screening assays based on their targets and I and mapped those targets to cardiovascular failure modes. And that allows us to visualize and rank the chemical bioactivity signatures against those key cardiovascular targets and to develop mechanistic hypotheses for environmental chemical cardiotoxicity. And so using structural and bioactivity based clustering approaches, we can identify environmental chemicals for further testing in complex and experimental systems. And some of the chemicals that we identified from this approach are things like flame retardant compounds, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so not a surprise there, components of air pollution, which is well known to have strong effects on the cardiovascular system. Um, others that were maybe not quite as well anticipated like bisphenol compounds, organotins, quaternary ammonium compounds. So the chemicals that were identified using these um, cardiotox pi predictions will be tested in mechanistically informative in vitro systems um, that are being provided by our partners at NCATS, Dave Gerhold and Mark Ferrer, um, who are developing models that use induced pluripotent stem cells and uh, using their 3D bioprinting capabilities to develop models that incorporate things like shear flow and co-cultures of different types of vascular cells, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. And so these mechanistically informative in vitro systems will help uh, inform upon the chemical cardiotoxic potential and assist in hypothesizing adverse outcome pathways and potentially lead to further assessment in more complex systems models. So that really brings us back, I think full circle to where we started um, and the importance of computational approaches and how we're building and leveraging them to support every aspect of this continuum. And uh, I think ultimately continued success in this area, you know, really requires the continued support of appropriate toolkits and resources and infrastructure. And I mean that in the broadest sense of the word, you know, computational infrastructure, administrative infrastructure, scientific infrastructure to really enable and empower safety science, moving augmented intelligence from research to decision-making from maybe less familiar to more mainstream. Um, so I will just leave you with a, an opportunity to learn more. Um, there was a, a special issue of Chemical Research and Toxicology that was just published yesterday. Um, so I was a co-editor of this special issue with Wida Tong from the FDA and Igor Tetko. And this is a really outstanding a uh, special issue of the journal. At, we actually broke records for the largest number of articles in any special issue that ACS had had so far in this particular area. 38 different papers from the US, UK, Europe, Asia, Brazil. Uh, it includes the, the paper on the polycyclic aromatic compounds that was highlighted by Dr. Wojciech. Uh, it also includes the paper on the cardiotox work that I just discussed briefly. That was actually chosen for the cover image of the special issue. So we're really excited about that. Um, so that's, again, it was available online as of yesterday. So I'd encourage you to, to go read those papers if you're interested in learning more about this field. And I'll just thank a number of individuals who contributed directly to the example projects I've discussed today. Um, you know, please understand I've only touched upon a, a portion of the work that we do. We have a much broader list of extramural collaborators as well. Um, but most importantly, I need to thank uh, my group. Um, so this is our 
2020 photo in homage to all of the protective measures that we've all put in place. Um, but this is their smiling faces and I'm really privileged to be able to be leading this group. These are largely um, support contractors that work for companies like Integrated Laboratory Systems uh, and SIOM and they're really tremendous individuals. So thank you and I will take any questions. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Do we have any questions? Uh, it looks like Bob, uh, Dr. White has his hand up. Bob, you wanna take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was a tour de force. Um, very, very impressive, important work. That's clearly the future of toxicology. Um, I, the one piece that I'm curious about is human populations. So what kind of work is planned or is happening with say, well, there's two areas that come to mind, exposomics, untargeted chemical assays that may maybe you're discovering chemicals for which there's relatively little toxicology data, but perhaps some of these tools could be important, but also gene environment interaction where these tools could potentially prioritize chemicals uh, from a GWAS or whole genome sequencing with respect to gene environment interactions and probably reduce some of the multiple comparisons issues. Is there any work going on in either of those two areas? In human. Thanks, Bob. Those are, that's, that's a really outstanding point. Um, and I think that, the answer is yes, um, it's not our particular sort of forte, but we're trying to partner as much as possible with some of the investigators that have, um, I think really strong programs in those areas. So for example, in our intramural division, um, you know, we have an, an incredible epidemiological branch. We have, you know, our uh, branch chief of our biostatistics and computational biology branch, I, Allison Motzinger Reif, who does a ton of GWAS work. And so we're trying to investigate connection points with those investigators to try and bring in some more of that information. Um, the, some of the work that I didn't get to touch on uh, where we do try and incorporate kind of distributions of parameters across human populations is some of that um, PBPK modeling and IVIVE work. Um, so you can model kind of distributions across different populations of humans based on their different parameter distributions. So we do have that available. Um, but in terms of actually incorporating exposomics, GWAS, you know, those are, those are all kind of open questions where we can only do so much within our group and we recognize that we can't be experts in everything. And so we're trying to kind of facilitate making those connections with groups that specialize in those spaces so that we can apply kind of our computational know-how and our techniques to incorporating that information because it's very, you know, it's very relevant, obviously. So I appreciate, that. really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm sorry, our next question is from Dr. Cordero. Push the wrong button, sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, this was just a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. <clears throat> I have two questions, one about the past and one perhaps a little bit more in the future. But you pointed out in your presentation that sometimes uh, a, the way that, that uh, issues are reported, you know, I think you mentioned microcephaly or small eyes and so on. Uh, to what extent uh, what you're learning can be or should be applied in terms of uh, developing some standards in terms of publications. So let me just put that in, but also give you the second question about the future. Uh, someone's, uh, okay. Uh, but the, this, the, in, the, in the future, uh, what about when, uh, when you have new chemicals that are new structures and and uh, little is known about, and uh, for us, let's say uh, in reproductive toxicology, uh, new chemicals in which you have very little to go in terms of teratogenicity uh, and how could uh, a system like that may actually help us? Thank, thank you, Dr. Cordero. Both excellent questions, excellent points. So I'll, I'll start with the first one in terms of reporting formats. Um, Obviously, there are a number of organizations that are trying to implement standards. So the SEND reporting format that the FDA has implemented um, will really, really help us in terms of putting data into a structured format. Um, another 
uh, sort of controlled set of terminologies that I think are very useful are the OECD harmonized template reporting formats. So in the example that I briefly touched upon where we're taking the developmental toxicity studies, both from the National Toxicology Program, but also from um, studies that have been submitted to the European Chemicals Agency, uh, one of the systems of controlled vocabularies that we're using to map those, um, those, the language from those primary studies to are the terminologies used in the OECD harmonized templates to try and help, you know, create those supersets of data so that when there are new studies that are reported to OECD in those harmonized templates, they can be automatically joined with kind of the historical database that we've created um, that's already mapped to those terminologies. And now we've done the same with that U with the unified medical language system of codes that the EPA applied to their toxicological reference database um, to try and provide a resource for them as well so that they've already mapped to UMLS. We provide that crosswalk from UMLS to OECD harmonized templates so they can now essentially automatically convert all of ToxRFDB in into those OECD harmonized terms as well. Um, so there are a number of ongoing sort of international efforts to create those, those internationally harmonized sets of terminologies. Um, but in terms of, you know, in publishing, you know, that's something that's a little bit, that's more challenging, right? It's a little bit of like the wild, wild west when you're talking about like the open scientific literature, right. you know, you can't really tell someone how to articulate their findings in language that is, you know, structured and standardized and isn't going to allow them like their creativity and th their own free speech. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's a little, that's a tougher um, bridge to cross, I think. Um, but I think with the, the automated workflow that I, I tried to show you guys as far as like how to identify those high quality studies, how to extract that information, and then how to actually automate the uh, mapping of those extractions to those harmonized templates, maybe we won't have to require people to describe their results in a certain format. We'll have computational workflows that can take their, you know, original unique <coughs> language and automatically map it to those harmonized terms. And then to your second question about sort of new chemicals and how can we leverage these tools to try and predict very complex endpoints like developmental toxicity, reproductive toxicity, um, I think that that's where we try and break it down into understanding those mechanisms. So um, I spent a lot of time, as you know, with Tom Knudsen at the EPA as part of his virtual embryo group, um, building agent-based models to predict disruption of embryonic vascular development. So that's one very specific way that a chemical can interfere with embryonic development. Um, but if we have enough assays that are mapped to that, those particular biological pathways, and then we have enough data on enough chemicals in those assays that we can build effective computational structure-based models, then we have a suite of tools that map to sort of each mechanism of developmental toxicity that can allow for the prediction of the likelihood that new chemicals might be affecting those individual biological pathways in sort of a, a comprehensive type of an approach. Thank you. Um, I think our next question is from uh, uh, May, if you want to ask your question. You're, um, you're mute. Yeah. Nicole, congratulations to your wonderful presentations. Um, this, but I have a couple of questions. Um, how would you um, actually use all these um, new tools that you have developed to influence the ongoing projects that are at NIH, such as all of us, um, such as this uh, science data catalysis, and also in a more um, kind of dramatic way, like um, focusing on um, big data to knowledge and human genome projects, the N3N. So they have multiple um, kind, um, kind of human-based uh, projects that are ongoing. And how could these um, chemicals and toxicology field influences those studies? 
Thank you. That again, that's a really excellent point. And I think that kind of goes back to the point that Bob was making earlier as well about the need for there to be sort of mutually informative lines of communication between the work that we're doing and the work that those um, those projects are undertaking in terms of collecting human data, um, understanding, you know, what does the exposome that actually look like in terms of what is the body burden of environmental chemicals that different segments of the human population are, are, are really suffering from. And so from our perspective, we would like to get more of that information, um, but we would also like to give more information around, you know, what should biomonitoring studies be looking for, right? So we've if we've screened 800,000 chemicals in our toxicity prediction models, and we can prioritize those in a way that will allow for sort of a, an inf formative approach to um, identifying compounds that should be included in biomonitoring studies, then that's something where we would really like to, to be able to, to help, right? Um, so I, I think the projects that you mentioned are really critical connection points for us in kind of leveraging our position within NIH to try and work collectively and cooperatively towards that broad, towards that common goal. So what I find uh, commonly is that a lot of these NIH mega projects among like, you know, 10 or 15 institutes, they tend to leave out pretty much NIEHS. So they don't look at toxicants. Uh, so, so therefore your work is so significant. I, I believe it will be important for, for somehow uh, this message to get across so that the whole entire NIH will will have a mindset of looking at the environmental, I wouldn't call it toxicants or compounds, uh, that mimic compounds that potentially are to either toxic or influencing all these biological processes. So um, sometimes I find it very frustrated to see that all those projects that are millions of dollars projects that one even had one word about talks, um, environmental influences. So I, I think you are doing such a wonderful work if you can actually have this bi-directional interaction with these big data projects that are ongoing, especially right now with the COVID, there are go, gonna be a lot of follow-up and, and, and research. And I, I feel that the NIHS can contribute in this way. Trips me a great point I'm again. Uh, we're going to keep. Can it echo there, Rick? You are muted. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You, we can't hear you, Rick. Okay. I was just going to suggest. Dr. Woodchick, press running... star six on your phone. Okay, okay great. That, Here we are. So they, Trip made great point. And uh, rest assured that I will continue to press this issue with other IC directors. So in the interest of time, we have two more. I'm going to let uh, two more questions. Uh, we'll, and I want to be respectful of people's time. So uh, Trevor and, and then Terry, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Um, and Dr. Um, Penning and then Dr. Cavanaugh in that order, um, if you can ask your questions. Uh, sure. This is uh, uh, Trevor Penning. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. I have I have actually a couple of questions for you. H how does your uh, predictive toxicology take you into account uh, metabolism? Sure. Okay, we can do the one by one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I like that better than you list, having no, no. a list of questions okay. and having one. to remember them. <laughs> one by one. Okay, great. So. Um, yeah, metabolism is always a huge issue, right? In particular, when you're looking at like in vitro assay systems that don't generally include metabolic capability. So we we have to come up with um, computational methods to try and predict um, the effects of metabolism. 
Um, although I will say that more and more we are evolving towards like microphysiological systems um, that do incorporate metabolic capacity and uh, you know liver spheroid models, co-culture systems, uh, microfluidic systems um, that actually will you know provide more of that that uh, biologically kind of realistic uh, informed approach to to assessing chemical toxicity that that does incorporate metabolism, but that's on the experimental side. So on the computational side, you know, we have um, metabolism simulation predictors. Um, so we, you know, we are able to predict the results of first and second pass metabolism and then predict what the metabolites from those parent compounds would be. And that's actually one huge advantage of computational approaches where you can run hundreds of thousands of chemicals in a very you know, resource efficient manner. So if we can run metabolism simulators, predict the metabolites and the daughter compounds of those parent compounds, and then run those structures through our toxicity prediction models, um, then it's a, it's a very effective um, and efficient way to actually predict the toxicity in a way that incorporates metabolism. So thank you. So my second question is, is that in some of your earlier studies, you showed very linear adverse outcome pathway constructs and quite often we're dealing with systems. So that's one problem you probably are thinking about. But I was also wondering if you have any examples whereby there was not an adverse outcome pathway to begin with, but your computational methods actually identified an adverse outcome pathway for you. Yeah, that that's a that's a really great point. And you know, that's one of the um, kind of gripes that I have with the whole AOP concept is that it certainly is often oversimplified for communication purposes um, to be sort of a linear representation. And we all know that biology is not that simple. And that ultimately what it is, is it's networks of AOPs that are interconnected and interacting um, and that are they're much more complex than any sort of a linear process could, could ever really represent. And um, the, that's actually an entire field and, or entire subfield of what we do is trying to computationally hypothesize adverse outcome pathway networks and quantify key event relationships um, using the data sets that we have available to us. Um, so not something that I was able to spend any time talking about today, but yes, it's something that we're, we're working very actively in. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, Terry, would you like to ask your uh, last question, please? Yes, um, Nicole, again, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, absolutely fabulous work that you guys are doing. And I see you. Um, I had a question about to what extent, um, you know, some of these very large databases, uh, 800,000 chemicals or whatever, also incorporate things like engineered nanomaterials, uh, flavorants from vaping, uh, natural products that might either they themselves be toxic or uh, somehow modulate the toxicity of more conventional chemicals. Is there ways to actually incorporate those sorts of things into your um, uh, databases and look at the intersections that they might have with uh, the predictive models you have? So yeah, that's a great point. I mean, those are really challenging, right? It's a lot easier for us from a computational perspective to build models on monoconstituent substances with well-defined structures, obviously. Um, but we do have working groups like under ICVAM, we have the nano work group that is really focused on nanomaterials, methods development for understanding toxicity of nanomaterials, needs of different federal agencies in the nano space. Um, so we have a lot of work ongoing there um, in terms of other sort of more complex mixtures, looking at uh, additives, flavorants, natural products. Um, the DNTP has an entire program around mixtures um, that was actually uh, under uh, it was the, the subject of our last Board of Scientific Counselors meeting just a couple of weeks ago. Um, they presented kind of their program plan for combined exposures and mixtures and how they're going about that. Um, and so that's run by some really, really talented and intelligent folks. And so, you know, we're, we're hoping to be able to work with them as much as possible. But at the moment, um, most of our computational approaches are 
kind of targeted towards modeling single chemical effects. And then we can use systems-based models to try and bring to bear, you know, the, the likelihood of interactions between those different individual chemicals in realistic exposure scenarios. Um, but we need the data, right, to be able to train those models. And so it's, it's, it's sort of an iterative process that needs to be mutually informative. Okay, well, thanks, Nicole. What a great talk. I appreciate your, your joining us today and clearly generating a lot of uh, interest amongst our council members. Uh, and I appreciate so everyone. Uh, yes, I appreciate everyone hanging with us here. Uh, Rick, did you have any closing comments before we break for the day? No, I think we're all set. We're running uh, quite a bit uh, over schedule, but that was a very interesting and very stimulating talk, Nicole. And so thanks everyone for their questions and their engagement. And I think it's time to adjourn for today. So, Pat, I'll turn it back over to you. I have nothing else. I would just say that if you have a chance to, if you've not had a chance to look at chat, you uh, hopefully we can have it tomorrow. But um, thank you, everybody, for your time. And we will see you bright and early, well, bright and early, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Have a great evening. Well, for those, for those on the West Coast, it'll be a little bit brighter and earlier than the rest of us. So thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye.